How's the Detroit Sports Podcast going? This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Hey, everybody, this is Freddie Cohen of ESPN Radio. When I'm not talking about breaking news or breaking news on ESPN Radio, I'm always a fan and listening to the Detroit Sports Podcast, and so should you. Welcome in, everybody. Thank you for joining us on the latest edition of the Doc and Jock podcast. I am the Doc, John Macaroon. Joining me, my cousin, Adam, the Jock Strozinski. What's up, cuz? What's happening? Man, this weekend was absolutely bananas. Every time you turned around, there was some kind of free agency move going on. It was like Christmas Day for the NHL and the NBA, and the Red Wings and the Pistons were just kind of sitting there with coal in their stockings. It It was weird. In the second half of the podcast, we'll definitely talk about it because I found myself going, wow, July 1st hit. I was glued to Twitter, and uh, there were reporters from ESPN, Yahoo, and I was definitely excited to hear the news about Paul George, hearing the news uh, later on about LeBron James, and then you hear the news about Boogie Cousins. It has been really exciting with the NBA. they got to be loving this because the NBA has been in the news nonstop since July 1st. It's been unbelievable. We'll talk about it in relation to the NHL because – Adam Silver, I like it. He's come out and he said, I think that based upon the popularity of the NBA, what is actually happening, that we got a chance to rival the NFL. And uh, I was like, whoa, you're actually saying that? And he believes that the NBA can rival the NFL. And it's going to be something to talk about. But you got into it a little bit with some of our supporters regarding the Red Wings because of the fact that they made moves. They, you know, added Mike Green and Thomas Vanek gave them no trade clause, and they added a goaltender, a backup goaltender for uh, Jimmy Howard to try and compete, uh, Jonathan Bernier from Colorado, and he's coming here saying that I want to compete to be the starting goaltender, and he's going to get more time than he obviously did in Colorado. But the debate that you had back and forth was really interesting because the supporters kind of, some of them feel like, you know what, the Red Wings are actually better by adding these three players, and you maybe had a different take on it. Yeah, so big shout out to uh, Mike Putnam, big time supporter of the podcast, listens to all of our stuff, real interactive on on Twitter with us. Um, I want to thank him for basically doing my show prep for me this week because <laughs> uh, we're just taking something that we were discussing and a poll that he wanted you to put up, and, and we're just going to kind of roll with it and delve into it. But he believes that the Red Wings are better now than they were a year ago, and I think there is some facts to that. It, it, there, there's some truth there, but... I don't know if you're going to see a better product on the ice when everything is said and done. All right. You you go out and you add Mike Green, you sign him to a a, a two year deal, and that's great. All right. Mike Green was probably your best defenseman that you had all last season, but he was not a very good defenseman. So what's that say? You're bringing back the worst of a really bad product, and you give him a no trade clause. So now you can't even move this guy. This was a guy who you were looking to move last year at the deadline, and now you're stuck with him for two years. And remember, he's a really bad defenseman. He, he's very good offensively, but he's not a very good defenseman. To your point, Ken Holland was asked these questions when he's tried to defend these moves. And he said last season, the Red Wings went to Mike Green, and they presented some trade opportunities. And Mike Green was willing. And so I understand where the trade clause might upset people. But he, but Ken Holland said, look, we would not have been able to sign Thomas Vanek. We would not have been able to sign Mike Green if we did not offer them um, something to kind of entice them to come to the Red Wings. So don't sign him. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking as well. Because so, so don't sign them. Exactly. I mean, look, Thomas Vanek, when you had him, he, exactly. he, he was an exceptional player for you. But he's older. And he takes like a month or two off every season, and he's, he disappears. He doesn't he's, produce he's for a couple months. Super then Super sketchy. Then yeah. he scores like 10 goals in 12 games, and everyone's like, oh, we like Thomas Vanek. Yep. So it's a weird signing. I was against it completely because I'm of the opinion that a rebuild involves playing a bunch of young cats, let them learn. And actually, whether or not you agree with playing young players, the point is is I'm tired of them being in purgatory, like the Pistons. This year, look what happened. They yep. scored, what, seven? Uh, they earned 70 points or so, and they missed the postseason, and they didn't even earn the number one pick. 
You missed out on a world-class defenseman, and you weren't able to, you know, uh, re- revolutionize your team. You got a guy that, by luck— You got lucky. Yes. Yeah. And, but and, going forward, if you continue to do this, it's going to be the, more of the same. Right. And, and my, my point that I would make to you is roll the dice again. Be bad again. Don't sit there and, and try to just make it into the playoffs. Why? How is that going to help you? Be bad again. Go out there and get a number one overall player— whether it be a forward or a defenseman, and add him, add that talent to your team. And and now look, there's no way that you know 100% that it's going to pan out. But generally, in the NHL draft, there's always one guy, usually at the very, very top, who's got a better than 65% chance of really working out for you. So what's the argument being made by the other side that the Red Wings are better? Well, I think a lot of it has to do with the draft. Now, if you look at what they did with this draft, yeah, I think we all agree all the pundits say that the Red Wings killed this draft. That's cool. Those guys aren't going to make an impact for at least two or three years. You know, Zidana might come up, and he might play, and that's okay. That's cool. But that's one guy out of, what, ten guys that you drafted? So you can't say that this draft class is going to pay immediate dividends. Your draft classes usually come down the line two, three years, maybe four or five, depending on how young these guys are. So I think the draft has really clouded a lot of people's judgment. If you look at what they did in free agency— they just brought in a bunch of veterans. The only contract I really don't have a huge problem with is the Jonathan Bernier contract. He's going to push Jimmy Howard. He wasn't a lot of money. If everything works out and he's productive, you might be able to send Jimmy Howard out of here, and then you've got your goaltender for the next two years until one of these guys in your in your farm system come up. You know, and, and I think if they're might, worth a damn. There might be an assumption that Zadina and Rasmussen are going to come up. Maybe even Tyler Bertuzzi could get and, more minutes on I, the ice. I think that's the hope, and, and that's where we're all at. We want to see these guys, but I want to see more guys. I want to see this team infused with young talent. I don't want to see Mike Green out there. I don't want to see Thomas Vanek. I don't need retreads. And I, I look, I heard Ken Holland's interview on uh, on the ticket, and Ken Holland said, Look, you, you got to have some veterans. You got to have some guys who are going to come out there and help these guys win games and show them how to win games. If you put them out there and they just get beat every single night, their confidence gets shot. I get it. I understand because I've played on teams where we won zero games. It makes it really hard to show up every single day to the rink to want to play. Like everybody's looking for the for the front door because everyone wants to check out. So I get it. All that being said, you have to have some good leadership on this team, and that should come from your head coach. It should come from your captain. And Zetterberg might be out the door. We're not really sure what his back's going to do, but you have to have some leadership on this team and infuse it with some young talent. Have these guys start to to to, to, pro, to progress and, and do things on the ice. By leaving them in the AHL, I mean, some of these guys, it's like having the equivalent of a 4A baseball player. You know, they're kind of in this in-between area where, hey, we're better than our minor league club, but we're not quite good enough to make it to, to the show. At some point, you got to sink or swim. Throw them up there. See what you got. Roll the dice. Are you expecting anything from this Detroit Red Wing team this year? No. Okay. No. Yeah. Are you expecting anything next year? Mm, ah. You would expect to see some progress, but you're not expecting them to, to compete for a Stanley Cup. Right. You know, and I think that's where all Red Wing fans are. So if you lose this season, what's it really hurting? Well, maybe some of the supporters feel like, okay, uh, are they better is there a chance for them to have more than 69, 70 points? Maybe, but does it mean that they're going to actually get to the postseason and win a round? No, they could sneak in barely into the postseason and then face a Tampa Bay team, a Boston team, and get broomed out. I don't want that. I want a team that when we enter the season has a chance to make a deep run. So when you ask me, do I feel like this version of the Red Wings can advance farther in the postseason? No, and uh, that's just based on the fact that the Red Wings are continuing to do the same thing where you don't get a real vibe that the likes of a Zadina, if he's on the roster, is going to get 25 minutes a game. You feel like if he makes a mistake, is Dan Bilesma and Jeff Blash are going to go, no, 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 we're going to limit his minutes down to 15 as opposed to 25. Are the likes see, I'm of, not even are, sure he's going to get that many minutes. See, the, uh, he's a right? rookie. I'm thinking Why he's not? probably going to be 12 to 12 to 14 minutes. I mean, if you look at what Athens see you got you last year, High end, I think that's what you can what you can expect, you know. And after to see you, I think he only gave you fourteen, maybe fifteen minutes a, a game. Are the Red Wings better now compared to last year? I say yes, they are. Do I think that they're better because of what they've done in free agency? No, not at all. I think they're better because they had a really good draft, and we've already discussed the draft. You have no idea what you're going to get. You won't know for two or three years. The hope is. Uh, Zadina comes up and, and he pays immediate dividends. He scores a couple goals for you. 
has a really nice rookie season. Maybe uh, Valeno comes up and, and he plays the the second half of the season and he's really productive. You know, maybe the the Rath, Rath, Rathmussen, you say it for me because Rasmussen. There you go. Thank you. I'm tongue tied over here. Maybe he comes up and he's really productive. Maybe Bertuzzi gets more minutes and, and he shows something. You know, that's what the hope is here. But I don't necessarily think that this team is in, in the mindset of, of challenging for a Stanley Cup. I, I think they're at this point. They're like, well, how do we get to the playoffs? Or how are we at least competitive when the playoffs start to kind of roll around and we're not like the first team eliminated? I think that's where the mindset is. So I, I think the additions of Thomas Vanek, Jonathan Bernier, and, and Mike Green, does it make them a playoff contender? I don't know. You know, I, I think those guys add a little bit of a punch for this team, but I don't think they necessarily make them better. And I think the big question, if you're a Red Wing fan, the big question should be, do you want them to be a playoff contender next season? Do you really want that? I myself, I'd much rather have them suck so bad and end up in the lotto and end up with the first, maybe the second overall pick and have another shot to add a guy who we're all salivating over who were sitting there and we're talking about how they just murdered this draft, how they went out and they just added three or four guys who we can't wait to see up in the big show instead of going into the playoffs and just getting housed. And that's the biggest complaint that Red Wings fans have is that the pace of this rebuild is is incredibly slow. And I, I was telling Jason this is that it kind of feels like Ken Holland is, is treating this like he has a 50-year contract and he can take his time, take five or six years to do this, whereas we could have started this process several years ago. And it's unfortunate that that's the way that Ken Holland is approaching this, but that is the plan. They're not going to just tear it down. He believes, and he keeps saying it on the airwaves, that – I want to be competitive night in, night out. We don't want to hear that word. No. He keeps saying, I want to be competitive. And I understand it is definitely tough to show up to the rink believing that you cannot win a game. But unfortunately, how do you acquire that talent? How do you go out there and sign guys that are going to be productive in a hard salary cap era? How do you go out there and do it? you got to build through the draft, and you got to have guys that are you know fall, you know know fall into you and, and want to come to Detroit. You remember that offseason where they're the two key players from Minnesota, we thought they were going to come here? And it didn't happen. That was an early sign that, oh boy, ooh, this salary cap era is something totally different because we were all like high and mighty. And we were like, oh yeah, they're coming here. We're going to get the pick of the litter like we did in the past. They didn't come here. They signed somewhere else. And, they, and we were like, oh, they went to Minnesota. Oh, they're signing somewhere else. They're taking money to go play back at home. And you're like, oh, we didn't get, you know, the, the, the Shea Webbers. We didn't get those that wanted to come here. I don't think this is a free agent destination right now. You know, it's going to take time. It, like you said, it's not like the Red Wing teams of the past where, hey, let's just throw a contract out there for you and you're going to sign it because we're going to be competitive and we're going to win a championship. And if we're not going to win a championship, we're going to be in the finals or we're going to be a round away from making it to the finals. So just sign the damn thing and let's go win. It's not like that. This isn't the same team that was rolling Luke Robitaille out there as your third line winger. You know what I'm saying? I think we, the other winger was Zach Parise that I wanted to it come was, here. It was yeah. Zach, yeah. It, it, you don't have, it, it, you're not a team full of Hall of Famers anymore. And you can't do it like that because unlike the NBA, you can't necessarily build super teams in the NHL. It doesn't work that way. You can't have one guy completely dominate an entire game. You can have a guy who can sit there and, and take over a game. It happens. I mean, Austin Matthews' first game, he totally took it over. It was one game, but... He totally took over his very first NHL game. You know what I'm saying? So it's not like basketball where you can have uh, whatever the equivalent of a LeBron James go to Toronto and then watch him just sit there and recruit three, four other guys to come in, and then those three, four other guys just dominate everything. It doesn't work like that in the NBA or in the NHL. It's it's different. To John Tavares just signed with 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 Toronto. All right. Shocking. But it, it, some people said, yeah, it's a childhood team, but I was surprised. I thought he would stay with the Islanders. I, I was surprised myself. Signs with Toronto. Now, Tavares on his best night is going to give you maybe 22 minutes. You know, he's playing a little bit more than a third of a game if that game doesn't go to overtime. It's not like the NBA where LeBron can play 48 and then you can go into overtime and he's going to give you another five. It's not like that. The NHL is totally different. So you can't build these super teams. And you just you just can't get guys to come here right now because you're in the rebuild. You've got to suck for a little bit. It's how it works. This is how sports works. You're really, really bad. 
for usually a really long time. And then all of a sudden, you have a season where you kind of break through and you almost get there and then you get swatted down. And then you know what? The next year, you usually find that. You find whatever it was that was lacking, whatever was missing from the season before, and you punch through and you win. And then if you're lucky enough, you can build around whatever that core was of that team and you might be able to get a dynasty. You know, I can argue with you right now that the Red Wings teams in the 90s and early 2000s, that was a dynasty. We can have this discussion if you wanted to. It's hard to do it right now in the NHL. And you got to be bad for a little bit because you got to have the core pieces that other guys want to play with. So I go to the newspapers, right? Obviously, great newspapers in town covering Detroit sports. And what's the first thing on the Red Wings section? Wings seeking balance between youth and veterans. And I'm like, oh, it just, it just, for me as a fan, it makes me grit my teeth. Mm-hmm. It makes me mad because I understand you need veteran presence. You need uh, the ability to have these guys teach younger cats how, with the Red Wings way and understand. I understand all that. But are these guys that are currently on the roster going to be here? Larkin, does he need veteran leadership at this point in time? Probably not. Mantha, does he need that? No. They're, they're, these guys are going to be tasked with becoming those leaders. Do you think Azadina needs it? Probably not. And so my thinking is, and, and what I believe most fans want is, we want a skewed uh, mix on this roster where it's all youth. And some people will say, I don't want to go down there and pay to watch the Red Wings display a bunch of young minor leaguers. I, I understand that part of it as well, is that you know when you're charging uh, sixty dollars a ticket and you want fans to come, but did you not pay attention to what the attendance was at LCA when you had a mix of veterans and young cats? Nobody showed up because you weren't winning. And right now, the biggest problem with the Red Wings and uh, Ken Holland and the organization can come out there and try and parade their thoughts about it. The biggest issue is their message is not reaching me the right way. Their message is we're rebuilding. The message that it comes to me is more of the same. That's the biggest problem. The problem is I see in early July more of the same. So that doesn't give me hope. doesn't give me passion. It just tells me, okay, you know what? Vanek's going to take up a bunch of time. Green's going to be out there on the ice in, in key situations and, and then getting hurt. And then the Red Wings are going to have a, a lull and they'll have a bad streak and they'll miss the postseason and we'll do this all again w- with the fifth pick. I'm like, no, go out there and do something different. I don't see this team shocking the world and you know backing into the postseason. I see more struggles because uh, this roster has too many guys that don't produce consistently enough based on their contracts. And so we still got to wait and be patient for two or three years to broom everybody out. And it's just the the way it is. And so right now, the best way to put it is the Red Wings are dormant. They are dormant. They have no stock, no buzz. And we just got to wait and see if Zadina, Valeno, uh, the young goaltender that we got, can do some things. But that's about it. Do you feel like Ken Holland, this free agency period, I, th- this is so typical Ken Holland. Let me go out. Let me sign some guys I'm really comfortable with, um, whether they be guys that we traded for at the time of the trade deadline or, or guys that have been in our organization before. Let's bring them in. Let's sign them to, to, to feel good deals. And let me parade these guys out and tell you how they're going to change everything. Do you realize Mike Green, entering the age of 33 this season, has played 212 games in a Red Wing jersey, and he is a minus 40. Wow. Minus 40. He has not had a plus season since he's been a Red Wing. His best season was when he was 30. Mind you, he's now going on three years away from that, and he was minus six then. The year after that, he was minus 20, and last year he was a minus 14. What that means is he's on the ice for more goals, 40 more goals. Scored against the Wings. Yes, than he scores, or that his line or his line mates score. That's not good. That's not good. And this is this is your best defenseman. This is the biggest issue I have with this, and this is why I get so upset when guys are like, well, he's our best defenseman. Well, yeah. What does that say about your defense? Your yeah. defense is horrible. Defense is horrible. So why are you going to go out and why are you going to bring this guy back in? Ooh. You know, if he's your best defenseman, why would you want to build around that? He's not good. I, I get it. He can run a power play. Cool, bro. How often do you get power plays? You know? And how long are your power plays? If you're lucky, you'll maybe have five of them a game, and they're at two minutes a clip. So you're talking about ten minutes of at least a 60-minute game. What are we talking about here? And he can't play the whole two minutes. And then... Uh, when you have Vanek, you go, okay, how many minutes is he going to take away from the likes of an Athanasiu, uh, Zadina, Valeno? He's going to be on the ice, and uh, I understand that might be a backup move. How concerned are you with the reports about Zetterberg? I mean, it's kind of taking more traction. Some people believe he will be on the ice for the Red Wings. Others are saying, look, there's a serious chance this dude's back is not responding as positively as we would like to the surgeries. There's a serious chance 
he misses some ice time. We need somebody that we need some bodies that have veteran presence that can put the puck in the net that have some semblance of NHL experience. Zetterberg leaving for me. Look, I thank him for his time, but I was ready to move on from Zetterberg like three years ago. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of too little, too late for me. I thank him for what he did. He won. He, he was part of Stanley Cup winning teams. He's been a, a massive contributor. He's played in a lot of games, and he's been a, a worthy captain. He's but been a great captain. I'm ready to move on from him just based on the contract, the length, and uh, what he's now capable of with that back. Like I said, most times now these contracts at the later end, and these guys when they turn in their you know late 30s is going to be tougher. But if he maybe is missing some time, it might not be so bad. I think he will play. I don't see him not playing unless he absolutely can't go. I do expect him to miss time, though. And I don't expect him to be 100% healthy. And I don't expect to get anything revolutionary from him. You know, Like you said, I'm ready for him to go. Whenever he's ready to go, I am okay with it. I don't want him to hold this organization hostage. And I don't think he will. He's been a great captain. You know, he stepped into a role where uh, Nick Lidstrom left, and those were big shoes to fill or big skates to fill. He filled them admirably. He's done a really good job. He's really helped a lot of these younger players develop, and I appreciate that. But at some point, you're the oldest guy on this team, and now your body's breaking down. What else can you give? You have nothing else to give. Just right off into the sunset. His contract, he's on one of those deals where as he gets older, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And I don't know if it's worth it to him to sit there and go out there and play for substantially less money than he played for last season. You know, I mean, he's taking more than a 50% pay cut this year. He's going to be making uh, $3,350,000 compared to the $7 million he was making last year. At what point is it just, it, it, does the money not mean anything? And, and at some point, your body is more important. It might be that time. I mean, and if you look at the way his his contract de-escalates, he's going to make 3.35 million this year. After that, it's a mill and it's a mill and then he's an unrestricted free agent in 2021. I don't know if you got the gusto to go anymore, you know? Like your back's done. Your nope. body's done. And if you're a hockey player, you know, if you have a back injury, good luck. Just getting bumped, skating's hard, everything is hard. You can't shoot, you can't do anything. Because there's so much torque and there's so much exertion that is put on your back. Good luck. All right. Now, before our first time out, uh, last week we discussed Steve Eisenman versus Nick Lidstrom. Mm -hmm. Well, people thought uh, in the newspaper that it was going to be close. It was not. Overwhelmingly, the readers voted Steve Eisenman into the next round. And so now we get the epic matchup that we all thought it would be. Stevie versus Gordy. Stevie versus Gordy. Who do you think wins in the the votership in the free press? (sighs) It depends on how many old people still have uh, newspapers. <laughs> R- really, it does. Um, old I think people, it would lean towards Steve Eiserman. Old people love Gordie Howe. Yeah. Like, me and my grandmother got into a huge fight. I told her that Wayne Gretzky was the greatest hockey player to ever live, and I didn't believe it because there were things Wayne Gretzky did. I just don't like Gordie Howe because I met him, and he was a jerk to me. But my grandmother had a really good relationship with him, and they hung out a couple times. So, anyways, me and her got into this argument, and it got heated between me and my grandma. And uh, she ended up throwing me out of her house. <laughs> like she was like, "Get the hell out of my house right now!" If you're going to talk that trash, so she threw me out because um, I wouldn't back down from her. But if old people have more newspapers now than I guess young people, then Gordy Howe's winning this. It means it's all going to come down to age. And I think the reason why Stevie Y beat Nikki was because everybody just remembers everybody remembers that first Stanley Cup that the Red Wings yeah. won when they finally broke through and technically that was an upset Stevie Y was a 3 seed and I and Nick Listrom was a 2 seed really yeah if you go back and you just i like i remember that that Stanley Cup there were so many years of just getting there and then losing getting there and then losing or getting close and losing and just going out there making trades pumping all this money to this team and never getting it done and then you finally break through and it's like oh that relief like I can't believe we did this. Like, I cried the first time they won the Stanley Cup. And then I cried the second time they won the Stanley Cup because I was like, oh, my God, I can't believe it happened again. And then after a while, you just started expecting it, you know? So he was he was the impetus for all of it. So I'm not surprised that he won. The fact that you said it was like a landslide, that blows my mind. Yeah. Like, absolutely blows my mind. I think everybody remembers just breaking through, and everybody remembers the joy of breaking through. I don't know. It, it's going to be close between Gordie Howell and Steve Eiserman. I Again, if you're if you're a younger audience member, you watch Steve Eisman play, 
you remember Steve Eiserman. If you're older, you probably watch Gordie Howe play, and you remember how awesome that was to watch that. I myself, I met Gordie Howe. I don't like him. <laughs> so it's Steve Eiserman all day for me. Gotcha. It would be so interesting to see. Don't ever meet your idols. Yeah. <laughs> the one thing, honestly, I swear to God. Could have had a bad day, bro. You met him once. Don't meet your idols. You said it was an epistle. It was an epistle, you said, No, right? it wasn't. No. Oh, that... I, I went and met him at an autograph signing. Oh, what happened? He was just. Wait, did you tell me a story? You met somebody else in a pisser, and uh, oh, maybe it was somebody no, else. It was in... my buddy. My buddy met uh, uh, Chris Chelios and, <laughs> and Brett Hall. Chris Chelios has a monster hog. Apparently. <laughs> All right. So what so, happened? Where, where'd you meet Gordy Howe? What I, I was I was a kid. I yeah. was like I don't know, like seven. Okay. I waited in line for two and a half hours in weather like we've had, like we're experiencing now, Hot. where it was like ninety five degrees and it's humid as hell. Waited in line. My mom sat there, scraped together however little bit of money that she had because when I was a kid growing up, we didn't have a whole lot. And uh, waited in line, like I said, two and a half hours. I bought a picture because I didn't have anything on me. It just happened to be in this area where he was signing autographs. And I was like, Mom, can we, can we, can we? And she was like, well, you don't have anything for him to sign. I was like, they might be selling something. Can we buy something? And she figured it all out. She made it work for me to try to make make my day. And um, I got up there to meet him, and he was real dismissive of me. And he was more interested in the set of boobs on my mom's friend than he was in me. Wow. And I was just, like, professing how much I loved him. And I just, like, I remember. You remembered that. Yeah. Like, it it pissed me off so much because I, I, I by, when I got my autograph, I just looked at my mom and I was like, like how do you tell your mom who just, like, scraped yeah. together all the linen buttons that she had to get this for you? Like, I don't even want this anymore. Like, how do you do that? You still got it? Uh, it ended up getting ruined in a flood. Oh. And I don't even care. Yeah. I don't even care. So, so, uh, so you you saw him like uh, gawking at uh, your mom's friend, or he said yeah, something? Yeah, like, or... he was. Well, he was like the the thing that really pissed me off was he was just dismissive of me. Yeah, like I was trying to like I was eight. Like yeah, so yeah. I get so it. You remember him? You're like, hey, I remember this guy, and he's looking at someone else, or, or not paying attention to you, or just yeah, he just kind of blew me off, and like I was trying to tell him how much like I appreciated like everything he did for for like Red Wing fans. Like I didn't like watch him play, right? But like I remember stories of him, right? So this was like before YouTube, so you couldn't go YouTube anything, but. I just was like telling him how much like I appreciated him and how much I was a fan because he was a Red Wing. Right. It didn't matter. You could have been it, it, it could have been um uh I, Mark Howe. <laughs> yeah, for real. It, it didn't really matter. You were a Red Wing. It, it, Tim Shevelday. Exactly. Fine. You were a Red Wing. I didn't care. You were my, that was my team when I was a kid growing up. You right. know, I loved hockey. So I was just telling him how much I I loved him and how much I loved the Red Wings and this and that and he was just like, "Yeah, all right, whatever, kid." And it just blew me off. And it just pissed me off cuz he's the whole time I'm talking to him, he's staring at at, at at tits mcgee over there and i'm just like bro like all i need is like two seconds of your time just right. acknowledge i exist yeah none of that so after that i was like you know what screw you like, gordy uh, how pretty much man oh man i'm sorry you had that experience yeah, but cool. uh, don't ever meet your idols man don't ever meet your idols i'll tell you a story off air okay don't ever meet your idols <laughs> don't ever oh he ended up bagging her <laughs> no <laughs> no <laughs> No. <laughs> no, I probably would have high-fived him for that. Yeah, yeah, there you go. All <laughs> right, <laughs> let's take our first time out. We'll come back, and we'll finish the podcast. Uh, shorter podcast today. It's the holiday week. Uh, we want to do our business and uh, also enjoy the holiday as well. But we're still giving you content here on Doc and Jock. Thank you so much for your Never support. Never taking a day off, baby. Never taking a day off. We'll be right back talking some NBA and uh, the big news of free agency. You listen to Doc and Jock on the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Let me tell you about our host site, Potomatic.com. When Adam and I first started this project, we were looking for a great place to host all of our recorded audio. We started this back in September of 2013, and up until this point, we've recorded over a 1,000 podcasts. We've only used one host site. Why do we use Potomatic? Super quick, easy to upload, great audio. We have great guests. We have great verbal warfare, talking Detroit sports, even in the summer. We take the audio and upload it quickly to Potomatic so that all of our supporters across the country and even overseas can find it. It's really great to uh, turn on the internet, turn on the computer, and find everybody saying thank you for keeping us in the loop regarding Detroit sports. We wouldn't be able to do that without the great use and the support of Potomatic.com. Well, cuz, big news of the last week. We got to talk about it. I know it's not Detroit specific, but it does play into the Eastern Conference and uh, some things happening across the NBA. LeBron James decided, and it didn't take long. 
He said it. He was open and honest. He said, look, I'm not doing the whole recruitment tour. I'm going to take these meetings. And you heard basically, you know, some rumblings that maybe he texted KD that he had maybe some meetings with Cleveland and the Sixers. But in the end, he just goes through his agency, releases a statement. He's going to the Los Angeles Lakers and uh, four years, about $38.5 million. And he's added some pieces with it with the likes of Lance Stevenson, Rajon Rondo, some of the draft picks that the Lakers have uh, with Mo Wagner. That's a team that's going to take a little bit of time. I don't see immediately him going to the Lakers and advancing that far in the postseason. But it does kind of shake out where you go, okay, if we do some foreshadowing, maybe Kawhi Leonard's on his way. Maybe some more free agents down the road may come to the Los Angeles Lakers. But with some additional moves that have been made, KD staying with the Warriors and Boogie Cousins signing the mid-level exception with the Warriors, there's been some rumors saying that some of these athletes in the NBA don't want to join up with LeBron. They want to kind of oppose him, and they want to be, uh, you know, basically, they want to earn respect off of LeBron by defeating the Lakers in a playoff series. It's interesting what's been going on in the NBA to kind of peek into. And, and I, I told you, and uh, I created a Twitter poll on our Twitter page, at Detroit Podcast. The last couple years, with who's going where, the short-term nature of the deals, the money, who's signing where, and how these teams are reformulated every couple of years, the NBA offseason is more exciting than the NFL. Whereas the NFL is uh, really centric toward the draft, after that, it's not as exciting because there's a cap and there's not a lot of teams being formulated in the way that the NBA is. So I put on a Twitter page whose draft is better, and the NBA kind of got a lot of votes, and I think they're in the lead. I'll check on it real quickly, but the NBA offseason, with the moves that I just described, has been awesome. It's funny you say that, because I think it was two or three weeks ago, prior to LeBron going to L.A., I think the playoffs were still kind of ongoing. Actually, playoffs had just wrapped up, just wrapped up. And I was talking to this guy at work, and we're just kind of going back and forth, back and forth. And it was like, okay, so how is everything going to shake out? Where are these guys going to end up? And he just like went through like a list of guys and where he thought they'd end up and where I thought they'd end up. And I was like, it all hinges on LeBron. I was like, there is so much drama in the NBA. This is the best part of the NBA and why it is so great with its offseason. There is so much drama these guys make. You know, the thing is, wherever LeBron goes, kind of situated where everybody else was going to fall into place. And it didn't really work out that way because I think Paul George was like the first to go. But where LeBron went, next thing you know, there was this mass flood of all these like mid-level exceptions in all these like B and C level players going to LA to sit there and help fill out the roster while you have a guy like Boogie Cousins like, yeah, screw that, bump that noise. I'll take the mid-level exception and I'm going to go win the championship with Golden State. Holler at your boy. So it, it just so much drama. It, it's it's awesome. It is absolutely awesome. I love the NFL. You know I love the NFL. You love the NFL. When football season's around, that's all we talk about. Basically, two weeks before college football season gets underway, all the way up until middle of February, we're talking football. But the NBA offseason, if you love soap operas, it is the soap opera. Absolutely crazy. LeBron going to the West opens up so many possibilities in the East now. And in the end, you might get your Lakers-Celtics rivalry once again. Probably not this year and probably not the year after that, but maybe in three years, you could probably see that. And it'll be different because instead of having Magic and Bird, it'll be LeBron and Kyrie, you know, which is there's so many storylines wrapped up in that. And this is what I'm talking about with the drama. There are so many storylines wrapped up in that. Have you peeked into what's been going on in the internet in terms of the reviews? Because some people are saying now, with uh, a plethora of all the big-time talent in the West, it basically makes the East irrelevant. And some people who are even prominent in town have said that, you know what, uh, going forward in the finals, the East might not win a game with the Warriors uh, acquiring. Oh, I don't uh, know about that. With, well, exactly. I disagreed heavily, but some of the reviews have said that, you know what, let's just uh, change up the whole playoffs. Let's reseed everybody 1-16. to Let's not have Eastern Conference, Western Conference playoffs anymore. Let's change it up because all the talent is in the West, and people are like, you know what, right now, it, this has not been good for the NBA, starting with LeBron making these super team type, type deals when he first left Cleveland to go to Miami. Some people have said that LeBron has ruined the NBA by, you know, the formation of super teams. And for me, my opinion is this. 
I, I like it. I like the fact now that the Warriors are the it team. Mm-hmm. Okay, because how excited were we? Everybody when Houston... loves a dynasty. Yeah, it's, it's drawn ratings. I mean, you had the same two teams in the finals the last four years, and the ratings this year were amazing. Mm-hmm. Why? Because there was a chance maybe that LeBron James could overtake the Warriors. And now there are, you know, just based on the history of the NBA, there's always been that team that's been the title holder. And there have been teams that have been trying to, you know, what we call upcomers. You have now Houston. You have the Lakers and the Sixers kind of waiting in the wings. And I don't think the Golden State Warriors are going to win like six in a row. They are stocked up. They are going to win probably over 70 games in 2018, 2019. But even that team uh, struggled to eliminate the Houston Rockets in six games. Uh, by then, the, the Rockets had the lead, and it, it required the Warriors to win the next two games. So, it, it, what, it, what it really came down to, too, was Chris Paul's hamstring snapping on him. So there's, it's not a foregone conclusion that the Warriors are going to win it. I do think they're the heavy favorite. They're the title holders, and you have to give them the proper respect. But the NBA is not ruined by LeBron doing this. And uh, like I've said in previous places, I like the fact that these players are leveraging themselves, taking shorter-term deals. I like the two-year deal where after one year you can decide Side, hey, my lever- my marketability is at the highest point. I'm going to go out there and, and test the market. That's what free agency is intended to do in the NBA. The athletes have figured out that this is what we can do to get the most money and to also have a chance to go to teams that can win. The NBA has always been like this, though. The NBA has always been like this. If you go back to the 80s, right? We're not even going to go back all that far. We're going to go back to the 80s. It was always the Lakers versus the Celtics. And the Lakers would get on a run, and they'd sit there and win three in a row, and then the Celtics would get on a run, and they'd win three in a row. And it would just be back and forth, back and forth. And then the Pistons showed up. Pistons won two in a row. Probably should have won three in a row. All right, And then the Bulls showed up, and the Bulls won three in a row. And then there was some crazy stuff that happened in the middle because Jordan and gambling and his dad and the mob and whatever else, conjecture. And then next thing you know, the Bulls win three more in a row. That there's always been dynasties. And somewhere in all that mix, San Antonio goes on a run, and they start winning championships. It, it, this is how the league has always been. So if you don't like super teams or you don't like teams that, that, that have these, that, these long runs where they're just winning championships, it's always been like this. And guess what? That's how it is. Boogie Cousins freaked out and called the Warriors because uh, when, the, when the free agency period started, nobody called him. He freaked out, and he, he couldn't sleep, and he, he was having one of those moments where he's like, what's going to be my future? What's going to happen? He was probably utterly shocked that nobody even uh, rang his telephone, and Are he you called. surprised by that? Um, That's probably the best thing that ever happened to that guy. Get scared, because your antics have made you a cancer that nobody really wants, and the Warriors were like, you know what? We'll take a flyer on you. By the way, you can't, you can't say that you hate super teams and then be like, I love when a guy takes less to win. Yeah. You can't have it both ways. Right. That's the one thing that drives me nuts. You can't have it both ways. A guy like Charles Barkley, we're talking about this in, 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 in pre-show. Charles Barkley goes on a podcast and basically says, I would much rather have zero rings than join a super team. What are you talking about? Do you not want to win? I would take, I would take peanuts to win all day long. It's always about winning a championship. No matter what. And what you're seeing is it's different for different guys at different times. For some people, it's about the money. And then for others, it's about, you know what? No, the drive to win is super important. Mm -hmm. And for some, you know, they're lucky enough to combine it for both, where KD can make a bunch of money and can get on a winning team. I never begrudge anybody for wanting to win. Never. So I don't hate KD for going and glomming on. But at the same time, in terms of ego, and which is something I definitely understand, there is something it's to be said. For me yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's, the, it's the John and Adam show. Right. In, in 45 <laughs> versus 12 for Adam. You know how it's going to go. The John and Adam show. The John show with Adam. I'm the baby footnote. <laughs> with Adam. <laughs> and damn, John's got all the sparkles and with Adam. <laughs> but I, I also understand those that say, you know what? Maybe the likes of Chris Paul. Paul George, they wanted to stay in their situation so that they can say, we were the next team. Because how awesome was it for Isaiah Thomas to be like, look, we were there when Jordan was there, and we crushed him, we kept him down, and then we took on the vaunted Lakers. And uh, Isaiah didn't join the Lakers. Do they beat the Celtics? He came when, in. When... He came into the league and was like, I'm winning a title. Yep. And he pursued it, and he took an organization like the Pistons and took them to a title. That's why the 2004 Pistons are amazing, was that they truly didn't have a superstar. And they came up, and they defeated the vaunted Lakers. And so... 
it's something where these athletes are not also uh, 100% willing to join super teams. They want to stay in their situations, and there is something to be said about being comfortable. And, hey, you know, really in the end, there's no real difference between $25 million and $35 million. It's still a bunch of money, and when you can play with talented individuals and be comfortable – I feel like it's a great victory for the likes of OKC and should be highlighted that not only did they trade for Paul George, but it was not a foregone conclusion that he was going to leave. Everybody assumed, look, this guy's going to the Lakers. You know what? Really nobody knows. Until you meet with, you know, these athletes meet with their families, they meet with their friends, and you really understand what they want. I don't begrudge anybody for taking the money, but for me, I'm the same way. I'd want a mix of money and uh, winning a title because there's no better feeling than spraying champagne being able to call yourself the best at what you do, and uh, there's no better feeling. That's why you do things is to compete. And when you go to compete, you don't compete for who, who really makes the most money. You really compete for who has a lot of rings, mm-hmm. and that's why I believe that um, some of these athletes – uh, and Charles Barkley, you got to also remember that he's heard that question a thousand times. And oh, every, sure. every interview is like, so what's it like not winning a ring? Mm-hmm. What's it like being uh, Michael Jordan's bitch? What's it like being you know, to the finals all the time and losing? It's got a way on you. So at some point, you just say, look – I'm okay with it. I'm not joining no super team. I'd rather win it myself and be that. And unfortunately, he stayed with teams, and he was unsuccessful in becoming a champion. So I don't begrudge Charles. you got to feel bad for the guy. I don't really feel bad for anybody. But <laughs> um, it, it, Look, so we've already established the West has a Stacked. ton of power, right? Yep. Houston's going to be a good team. Golden State looks like they're set for at least the next three years. Uh, Portland's got a solid team. OKC were able to bring back Paul George. So they've got third things going on. Utah is a young and up and coming team. Uh, the Pelicans, I, like Anthony Davis is a beast. Jaron Jackson so, dropped 29 in summer league. I think Memphis is coming back, baby. Right. Jaron Jackson <laughs> looks like the real deal. Yeah. Uh, Minnesota's Woo. solid. So you, you, the, the West is stacked. All right. But let's look at the East. All right. Boston took second place and gave Cleveland everything they could muster without their two best players, without their two best guys. Now you add those guys back into the fold. I'm savage. penciling Celtics into the, 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 the finals. Right. And then you look you look at the 76ers. 76ers have a great team, a very young team. 76ers are going to be good for a long time. They're going to challenge. All right? Toronto is a good team as well. So there is... Some there there is some power in the East. Yeah, it doesn't match up to to what the West has in, in all of its uh in, in encompassed glory because it's much smaller. You get you have a a much smaller ratio in the East. But I mean, look, Milwaukee's going to be a good team. Uh, if Washington can reload, they're going to be a good team. Miami has some pieces. Indiana has some pieces. And what all this does is it just opens up a way for Detroit now to get to the playoffs as long as they can stay healthy. And I think that's, if you're a Detroit Piston fan, that's what's important to you. Stay healthy, do some things. Look, you got a, you got a head coach whose hardest part of his career was getting by LeBron James. Guess who's not here anymore? LeBron James. LeBron's gone. All right. And you've gone out and you've made some moves and you're trying to do everything with this really, really tight salary cap that you have. And you're trying to add a few pieces here or there. You got, you, you, you got your big three. The ones that you believe in. Me and you don't believe in Reggie Jackson, but the Pistons do. And me and you don't really believe in Andre Drummond, but believe, the Pistons do. You believe in GR3? A wing? I, I like him. I do. I like that. I, I was really, I like that signing a lot. Um, bringing back Jose Calderon, eh, whatever. <laughs> On a day when Boogie signs, we get Jose Calderon. Right. right? What are you going to do? But you've got some, you've got some, you have some pieces here in Detroit. You got a coach who seems like he knows what he's doing. Stay healthy. Go out there and challenge and compete, and and I hope the teams in the East take offense to the entire world basically calling saying, them, yeah. everyone saying that basically it's the Western Conference and then the East is the scum of the earth. And I think the teams like the Sixers and the Celtics can win some games. Now, can they win it all? No, because the talent is great. I mean, the Warriors, if Boogie Cousins recovers well, are going to feature five All Stars. Mm-hmm. That starting lineup is sick, and that's fine. But you know what? I do think the next step for the Celtics is to get to the big dance, maybe struggle a little bit taste the the feeling of loss, and then I do believe the next team probably um, is not going to be a team from the West. It's not going to be Houston, not going to be the Lakers. I think the next team is the Celtics. I really like what uh, is going on over there. Brad Stevens seems to have a good head on his shoulders, and basically they fleeced Brooklyn for all those draft picks, and they got handed a, 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 the ability to get some talent, and they got young cats that are going to really be successful, and if Kyrie stays there, 
they they got a team, they got assassins that can do some things. Danny Ainge is a magician. Yes, by the way. and so He's I think absolutely crazy. The next team is going to be the Celtics, but it's not going to be for a couple years. And then you're going to have the 76ers hopefully uh, taking that next step, chirping a little bit, but. Unfortunately, the tough part is LeBron leaving for the Pistons also raises expectations. I expect the Pistons to be in the playoffs. You can't have a, a, a an East. You can't be in the Eastern Conference without LeBron and not make it to the postseason. I would be shocked. Would you be in favor of trading with Cleveland? You go get Kevin Love and Kyle Korver. So you got to make the contracts kind of match up. And you give them Blake Griffin. Yes, I do it yes. in a heartbeat. In a second, in a is heartbeat. that being talked about? No, I'm just throwing it oh. out there because I was I was curious. I was like, oh yes. <laughs> and you know what? I was I was well, about to joke well, around because Cleveland, Cleveland's talking about trading Kevin Love. So I'm like, all right, well, what's this contract look like? So uh, yeah. I'm, I'm looking trying to match up contracts. I was, here. you know, you know me because I clown around on Twitter. I was going to tweet LeBron and say, you interested in playing with Blake? You know, <laughs> you want to take? You know, is, does Blake on your radar? LeBron King, look, Blake's got some game. He can score 20 points. He can come off the bench. Don't you like Blake? Uh, it's like no, I li- he likes Ray John Rondo. Yeah. It's like don't you like Blake? Come a calling, come a calling for Blake Griffin. Would uh, would you prefer having Blake Griffin or because deals got done the other day or Tobias Harris for one more year, the twelfth overall pick, which turned out to be Miles Bridges and Avery Bradley for twelve it, yeah. and a half million dollars, right? See for two years. You see how I took that all day. I took that all day. It's yeah, just, I think you would have been much better off. Man, the Pistons made a splash, and it's like one of those things where it's like a one-day flash. You know what I mean? It's like one-day news hit. Like, we just made a big move to pay. Just look at, if you are in the mood to bang your head against the wall, just Google Blake Griffin's contract. In two or three years, dude is going to be making north of $35 million, and the production we're going to get is not going to be there. I mean, you can pencil it in. We did a contest, and we said, how many games is it going to be before Blake Griffin's hurt? And somebody got it right on the head. They said 25 games, and he got hurt. And that's what's going to happen is he's going to come out and average 22 points a game and maybe make a bunch of threes and maybe improve his game. And then all of a sudden, right when it needs it, right when we're going to play Golden State and it's going to be the big matchup, he'll go out. And same thing's going to happen to Reggie Jackson. And uh, it's just unfortunate because the same thing that's going on with the Red Wings is exactly happening with the Pistons. They're stuck in purgatory Mm -hmm. where they're not uh, moving toward a championship and they're not to the point where they're so devastatingly bad that they're going to get a good draft pick and get some talent. So... You know, when you don't have a first round pick and when you are in the first round, you're drafting 18th, it doesn't do nothing for anybody. So the the teams that are playing right now at LCA, they're dormant and they're going to struggle significantly to win over the fans. That's just the way it is. And so when we're excited, it, it hurts a little bit. You know, definitely we're sports fans and we like to definitely delve into the news of sports. But on the other side of it, it hurts in that we're left to speculate and hope that please, Adina, get on the ice. Can you get some minutes? Or please, can Blake Griffin shoot some threes and actually make them? It hurts as a sports fan to be in this position, but at the same time, we can turn our attention to the Lions, who are going all in with the efforts to try and uh, turn things around. But right now, it's been a decade of futility, and uh, at least with the Pistons and Red Wings, it's going in a bad direction. I'm That's what, lo- what it is. I'm just looking at these contracts. All right. And we wish, huh? You're right. Blake's is Blake's is a hard pill to swallow. You're not even giving him three months if we want him out, huh? Well, look, if he's healthy, he can be somebody you can right. enjoy to watch. But in terms of can we get past the second round of the playoffs, probably not. I, I, I would every single day of the week, though, I would take Kevin Love over Blake, Blake Griffin. I think Kevin Love needs a change of scenery, needs to play outside of LeBron's shadow. You bring him in here with Andre, that's the big man that you need to go with Andre, right? Andre's inside, he's outside. He's a guy, he's a stretch for. That could work, and that would work, all right? And then you bring in Kyle Korver off your bench, cool, bro, all day. And you ship Blake out of here, oh, my God, to be awesome. Great podcast, sir. Listen, anytime we can talk sports, uh, talking about things nationally or locally, it's always a good time. Thanks, everybody, for your support. We appreciate you going to DetroitSportsPodcast.com. Thank you to the supporters. Thank you to those that message us and uh, ask us questions about podcasting or even want to send us tapes and audio. We greatly appreciate the interaction. We greatly appreciate as well the hosts here that come in every week. Uh, Holiday or something going on in their lives, they've come in for the better part now of the last five years and made this something really fun. And uh, thank you to those that clicked on the the Vito article, the highest rated article on DetroitSportsPodcast.com in a long time. Uh, Vito's sticking around. He ain't going anywhere. Thanks to Adam, Shay, uh, Jason, Gus, Jerry, everybody that's done a podcast with us. We've had a good time with it. And so on the 4th of July, we're grateful. Thank you so much. When this drops, it, we will be sitting down, having a beer, uh, hopefully enjoying the nice vacation. Hopefully everybody has a chance to enjoy some time with family. See you, cuz. Happy post 4th of July.
This was locker room talk. Second dick. Sorry, Detroit. It didn't quite work out. And I, all I can say is Detroit Sports Podcast scores. I have voices in my head. They counsel me. They understand. They talk to me. Show me things I'll tell you.